Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, here with Benji as always, and this show is supported by our show partner Zwift, and this is the first of a kind. It's a one-week stage race overall wrap-up. We had a little bit of a break, not too long, uh, hope you missed us, and this is the Twitter Polonia recap. There's been some transfer news, we'll have a transfer roundup on the weekend as well as of Welter Burgos. Uh, round up the slightly more interesting race, but that finishes tomorrow. Slightly unusually, Polonia, a seven day stage race, finishes on a Friday. Uh, this world tour level, it started straight after the Tour de France farm and it's mostly sprint stages. So I'll do a rapid fire. Um, well, those two real GC stages of note. Stage three had like a collection of three 1.5k, 7% hills, then a sort of steep uh, six minute climb. And then there was a TT on stage six. There was actually no climbs of note, the likes of which maybe uh, Vingegaard or Hindley and Sivakov have done well in the 2018s, 19s region. Uh, but the first stage, sprint stage, won by Olav Koy and a fabulous lead out from Mike Turnison, who's going into Marche. Koy's first world tour win. Herban Tayson won the second sprint. Egita won uh, the punch. He finished the stage three, took the leader's jersey. Ackerman won a sort of uphill draggy sprint. He's quite good at after good lead out from Milano on stage four. Stage five, there was a big crash. Bauhaus won that sprint. Aronsman off to Ineos, rumoured, I think not confirmed yet. Uh, the Dutch rider on DSM won the TT, but Hayter took the leader's jersey because Aronsman lost, lost uh, like 18 seconds on stage three. And Demar won the final sprint just now on stage seven. So starting with Koi Benji. Yeah, this is, I guess, a rite of passage. Like, this is sort of the path that uh, an Ackerman and, and other riders take. They win, uh, I don't know, a, a Dot Pro sprints, a Hungry sprints, then Polonia. And I think next year we're going to see this kid stepping up to Paris East level sort of sprints, even though he might not get to start there. Agreed. And it's something we've noticed over the years. It was, like you said, Ackerman had this kind of like build up similar to what Hodge had, but Hodge felt the eventual actual world tour rise up towards the end. I think he had crashes as well as a consequence, but Ackerman had that move perfectly, went to the Giro then and was successful there, winning Chiclamino, if I recall correctly. But throughout this, we also noticed when it comes to Koi, he had that growth, but I'm starting to feel like his his Team Yumbo is somewhat limiting him in the abilities because we've said this before when it comes to Decker. We've said this that David Decker at Yumbo does not get the opportunities that he would get on other teams to get potential chances on on World Tour race. Like David Decker could be sprinting in a in a for the Polonia, for example, if he was on a different World Tour team. And when it comes to Koya, I feel like sent this guy to a Grand Tour and he's actually got a chance of winning a stage. Well, I think you Don't said you think the right so? one. You said the Giro. That has to be the one, right? Like yeah. I know Cohen Bauman did really well a couple of stages and um, the Malia Azzurra, but uh, Olaf Koy with Dumoulin's retiring, right? With Olaf yeah. Koy, that seems like the natural thing. I wouldn't say the team is holding him back in the races. Mm-hmm. I would say Turnison's lead out was extremely important yeah. in Koy winning. And when Turnison wasn't there today, he crashed out, did he not? Um, I'm assuming he did. He crashed heavily uh, the other day. He Koi didn't look so good without a lead out in this last stage. So anyway, that Ackerman trajectory seems to be the one. He got the job done there. Stage two, Herban Tayson, another Benelux sprinter, winning ahead of Ackerman. It was just, I don't know, Intermarche just keep getting guys performing. <laughs> Although Tayson, top three, some welter sprints for Lotto not yeah, that long but- ago. So did Abrastori, so... Abrastori's cracked. Um, <laughs> but then again, <laughs> it is still... It's not just two to Poland. Like, he came third behind Philipson and Jakobsen in, in Balwaza, too. Like, he's he's going all right. I mean, I don't think he's going to turn into a world beater, but he looks like a... Hand, they've turned him into a handy enough sprinter. I agree with that aspect. I will say when it comes to Abrastori, that kind of... Uh... That must be one of the most disappointing transfers, although it was pretty obvious it would fail at Trek Segafredo this year. But when it comes to uh, Herman Tyson, he had the Lotto days. He was decent when it comes to those Velta sprints. I recall those sprints pretty vividly. They were not against washed up people. And then when we look at the sprinters he's up against here, 
those are good sprinters. And it felt like that sprint with Tyson here was mainly the patience that paid off. I think there was a lot of riders that tried to go pretty hard towards the line and tried for a late attack. Perhaps Kluge, not 100% certain about that. Ackermann closed that. Tyson stayed in the wheel and Tyson used his wheel, the Ackermann wheel, to go past because Ackermann basically had to go early to close down the lotto rider or chose to go early to close down the lotto rider. I don't know. What if Ackermann doesn't close it? I don't know what would happen in that situation. Does the lotto rider just keep on going? Does a different rider close it for Tyson or does Tyson have to close it and therefore lose his sprint? So it's a patient that, patience that pays, paid it off here, I think, for Tyson. Ackerman, I think, is in good shape, and that will show a bit later. But whether you're down under and are buckling up for winter or buckled up, I hear it's been pretty cold in Sydney, or you're enjoying the end of summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, off the map is perfectly placed for a little seasonal tune-up. There are four off-the-map stages on Swift to complete for your chances to unlock a virtual kit for your avatar, as well as the opportunity to rock a map jersey that's exclusive to people who've completed the off the map challenge. After a month of Tour de France and Tour de France fam of X Swift, Benji and I are looking forward to getting back on the bike and we'll aim to complete all stages which have different route distances and difficulties so you can find your fun at a level that best suits you stage one is live now with rides on the hour every hour until saturday tomorrow to, so head to zwift.com to find out more about off the map and start your free seven day trial but stage three a bit of a break from the sprint action uh, was the Agita win. Seb Berwick, friend of the podcast, absolutely cracked. The Ineos train destroyed yeah. Carapaz's <laughs> legs. Yes, he jumped 250 minutes too early, but it's the, <laughs> it's the principle. It's the point that counts. Um, and again, this was patience, as Benji said. Like This this climb leveled off, and Agita was the most patient. He reacted to nothing. Ineos had to overreact to Berwick, and they did. And that sort of blew their legs and then there was when it came to the flat sprint Igita in the last 200 meters just kicked and beat Bill Bauer, Ermans, uh Sobrera and Pache, Pache now for GC Aronsman lost 19 seconds and finished behind Cavagna like and Narvaez who was 100% a domestique like I don't understand how he lost 19 seconds on this finish Benji yeah, it's hard to it's hard to grasp. We don't know if there was a situation where he got blocked behind someone or something, but it was a pretty wide road on which Ineos was storming with three riders. Perhaps the initial positioning was so bad that he eventually had to pass so many riders and failed to do so. I don't know, but it's not the situation you want to be in when you're trying to uh, do well for GC in this race. And the likes of a uh, hater did better on the stage when it comes to his timing, when it comes to his positioning, when it comes to staying good on the climb, and we know that. These climbs probably fit a bit better for Hater than, for example, an Ardman, Higita as well. Carapaz was the one where I was like, I don't know. From the start of this through the Polonia, I felt like Hater was going to be the strongest regardless. So I felt like they were protecting Carapaz a whole lot compared to what I was expecting to happen, knowing the time trial was still coming with Hater. Or do you think they chose wisely to try for the stage with Carapaz while holding on with Hater for GC? Um... I think they they were going for Hater for the stage and they were in a lot of stages yeah. and maybe they kind of give up. I don't know. Like, you look at this finish and he got beaten last year on a harder finish just by peak Wout and Al Philippe just before Worlds. Yeah. And he's beaten guys on a steeper finish in Andalusia, kicking away from them easily. And... It, it's no shame to lose to Igita. He's really, really good on these finishes too. But he got beaten by Lucas Hamilton and Felix Gall. Like it's like Hater should be doing better than this. I don't really, I don't really get it. Uh, and it didn't matter in the end. Like he still, um, spoiler alert, won GC. The next stage was Ackerman. Milano, uh, Milano did a really good lead out. I forgot that Milano should have probably been suspended. He didn't, by the way, get suspended for <laughs> yeah. punching. Um, Hugo Bash? Hugo Page, yeah, the French rider on Intermarché. He and he tugged his bike crazy. I don't know how that didn't get any sanction. But Ackerman looks really good. Uh, Bauhaus won on stage five, and this is where it kicked off. Tour de Polonia, it because of the Groenewegen and Jakobsen crash, there is a spotlight on the race in terms of safety. 
probably rightly so. And so the downhill finish was removed, uh, which featured in that that finish with Duke Runeveg and Jakobsen crash. But there's a big crash here. The corner, there's a right-hand corner, and the riders can't see in a 90-degree corner the, the exit. They can't see whether it widens or narrows. They, they can't see. All they know is 90-degree corner, I'm going to slow down enough to hit the apex to make the corner itself, and then hopefully it, it opens up or it stays the same width. If a corner narrows or doubles back more, that's when you get really big issues, when the barriers don't open up uh, with the natural road. And that's what happened here. And I just saw it, and before they ended I'm like, there's going to be a crash because it didn't open up. It got almost narrowed. Turnison goes down. I think a UAE rider went down before him when I saw the spectator view. And it kicked off on Twitter about Tour de Polonia again. And this wasn't just the the only finish that I thought, I was like, wow, that's a sketchy corner. There was another stage, I don't know which one, where by some act of God or a miracle, there was no crash. There was an island in a corner, in the corner, in a sprint finish like a proper island with like a pole in it. They couldn't even hop it. And somehow no one crashed. And I don't know, it's just, I can't even blame the race, Benji, because who is approving it? There's Since there's rules been brought in, there's a UCI like safety commissaire who's yep. supposed to approve the finishes. And I'd like, like to know, like, have they ever not approved a finish? Like, if, how are these passing? Yeah, and how how does that process even work? Like, again, I'm going to go through the Tour de Polonia stage of this year and mention the ones you've mentioned already, but in, in the order that they are, for example, stage one, there's a situation on the right side of the road with roughly a kilometer to go where the barriers basically go from a wide road to a narrow road to a wide road in the span of Pomination. 50 meters. Like, the barriers go inside the road, basically. And as a consequence, a UAE rider just narrowly avoids crashing, causing a ripple effect in the peloton that causes a crash on the opposite side of the peloton in stage one. So that's number one. We go to stage two. Fortunately, no crashes there. But if you look at the finish line, the road to the finish line actually narrows. So good luck sprinting in a straight line. Good luck. The deviation rule, that how to apply it. all the time too. Yeah, crazy. Like, it's another example of a thing that should not happen in a race. Again, I'm overanalyzing these finishes, but these are things that should not be happening in any race that occur. Like you mentioned, I think it's stage four, where at 400 meters to go, the traffic island is in the middle of a corner. Also, like you said earlier, you go into the corner, you don't expect the traffic island to be there, unless, for example, you recon that earlier digitally before the stage. Most teams have done it, but it's very different to look at it on a TV screen versus seeing the actual traffic on in real life in the middle of that corner. So you see another rider. I am not sure what team the rider is from, but narrowly evading that traffic island once again in this stage. And dude, I, I don't have an issue with the narrow roads that the Ackermann sprint win is on. Like, it's a slightly uphill finish. Those roads are kind of twisty. I have no issue with that part of this race, for example. And with stage five... I'll be honest, like the first time I saw the crash, I thought, okay, this is a rider slipping in a corner. But when you look at the corner, like you mentioned, it narrows in the corner, makes it much harder for the riders to figure out what is coming when they're going into that corner. But next to that, once the riders crash, we've got the same issue that we had in the Jakobs and Grunewagen crash, where the barriers disconnect and therefore it opens up completely. And it's the same barriers from what it, it looks like to me that were at that finish in Grunewagen Jakobs and those yellow banner barriers, the ones that move quickly, you saw them flying again in this specific crash. And that's something that was brought up as an issue back then and is still not fixed in this position. Now, I will say, Tour de Polonia has made significant moves when it comes to the safety at finish lines with the Bolplan uh, barriers, those like plastic things like the proper barriers that were used in hand Wevelheim and so forth. They are used at the finish line now, but not with 900 kilometer meters to go, for example. So that's the issue there. But they could have at least like anticipated going into this corner that issues could occur and therefore have those safety pillow thingies in those corners just in case people crash. But also, when it comes to the thing you mentioned, the UCI safety officer, how does that process even work? Like, it gets selected before it's put into the calendar. That's how I 
Reddit at least, based on the information that the Writers' Union put on a tweet earlier today. And when it comes to the actual check itself, how would one even check the barriers and so forth before a race? An hour before well, the Well, if you do it passed? in the morning, you, how do you change it? It's too exactly. late. Like, you got to set up the timing equipment, the finish. Like, how can you change it the morning of? And even worse, like, in this situation, it's the barriers. Like, something like that you can probably still change throughout the day. But if it's an issue like we had in Vuelta Burgos, where there's a downhill finish with a speed bump in it in the last kilometer, that's an issue with the initial selection of the race, I would guess. And, like, are they, is the commerce there when the route's announced and they get the GPX files, are they going onto Google Maps and imagining where the barriers will be? Or Google Earth or whatever it's called, Street View? Is that even updated on time? Well, yeah. Like, how else will they do it? Like, are they... I doubt when the GPX files are announced, I'll be, I'm will be. i happy to be corrected, they go and walk the course six weeks before. <laughs> like, I doubt it. So, yeah. yeah, and I guess the answer is, well, no, th- there's also the counter-argument that there will be crashes in sprint finishes. There is no way you will ever stop there being crashes in sprint finishes there is no way you're you are going to have sprint Agreed. finishes that are all five kilometers in a straight line no speed bumps no road furniture in europe it's impossible it doesn't exist and there's also the factor that based on like the normal non-cycling narrative is that people are trying to make Cities are trying to make themselves safer by adding those objects, by adding traffic islands, by adding speed bumps to make it safer for citizens and so forth throughout a normal day. But obviously I won't criticize that, but it indirectly makes the last kilometers of races and cycling harder because those cities pay to have finishes there, but they also pay to make traffic islands come into their city. So it's kind of... it. it well, well, and in the tour, they remove them. So when the tour route happens and a town pays, the tour will go ASO, I think, or whoever will go and be like, you need to get rid of that, you need to get rid of that, that needs to be changed in the finish, and they they rip it up because it's the Tour de France. And if you want the Tour de France, you're going to change it. Um, I don't know if that happens in other races. I will say, though, crashes will occur in sprints. Sprints are not going anywhere. You're not going to change the, you know, furniture in European towns anytime soon. That being said, if guys are going to risk life and limb and two, and teams are going to be compelled to go, they damn well better be getting some sponsor exposure out of it. The way the sport works is they get no TV, they get no revenue really from the races. They get no TV re- revenue sharing. They get paid from sponsors who pay them for exposure. So for guys to be risking life and limb when this race is has been almost impossible to watch, for anybody outside of Poland, it's just broken system. And like, it's just, and that's why, are Alperson here, Benji? This is always the, the test. Uh, they are here. They are here. Um, yeah. Are RK and Samzik here? They are not. So RK were like, mm, you know what? No, thank you. Don't feel like fielding a team. You know what other race RK didn't go to, which doesn't sell. I don't think has its rights in France free to air, the Giro d'Italia. RK were like, you know what? Second biggest grand tour? Don't feel like it. All the costs associated with it. We'll skip it because they actually get to, whereas the world tour teams don't have that luxury. That's why it's actually an unfair system in the relegation battle because RK can go to the most profitable races, both from exposure, both from points, and a race that doesn't offer that, they're like, meh, not going to go to that. Uh, but yeah, that's surely surely there'll be changes i don't know like if i was a world tour team having a field guys here it's just (laughs) i'd be looking at the costs and be like why am i doing this what is the point of this yeah i'll be honest like i've been criticizing the world tour tour calendar a lot in the sense that there's way too many belgian races races on it and so forth but polonian doesn't need to be on there either if they can't have proper international broadcasts then that is already a vital issue for me. And also the safety issues over the years stacking up is also an issue there. Now, again, it's not only the Tour de Polonia that has these issues. We've seen a much worse incident that felt at Burgos, for example, where the organizer actually came out to blame the rider, <laughs> which is crazy, but probably a legal thing. You'll know that. 
I don't know. But at least, you know, Burgos is not a world tour race, so the teams yeah. are there by choice. Um, even if Paul decided to skip it, I think maybe to the chagrin of uh, Quickstep and Lefebvre, he's won the race before, but we'll talk about that race uh, tomorrow. But just to round off the uh, Tour de Polonia stages, Bauhaus, he won that messy sprint. Uh, he That is what he does. He wins messy sprints. Aronsman won the TT, but as I said, it wasn't enough because he beat Hayter by eight seconds and he lost time, too much time in that stage three finish. Sheffield was second, actually. He beat Hayter and Cavani was fourth. Marco Brenner, DSM, went World Tour so young. at like and He must have signed the contract when he was like 17 years old. At 19, he's already starting to get good results. 19 years old, top five in a World Tour TT, that's a good result. He looked good at Norway, and then I think he got COVID. So he is like someone's going to want to sign that. Bora going to come knocking for that second contract, I think. That kid is, yeah. is legit. Um, and sorry, Damar. Damar wins the final sprint with Hayden not losing any time. He wins GC, misses out on the Commonwealth Games, I think. And... Yeah, Demar's carrying some good shape, but his lead out man Guarnieri's off apparently to Lotto next year. Again, we'll cover that in transfers. Coy second, Bauhaus third, and Sam Bennett. He came nineteenth. He was in okay position, but he just looked like he couldn't sprint. He came, him, him and Cavendish. Like I'm trying to see, did Cavendish finish this race? Um, <laughs> no, he abandoned for the uh, Commonwealth Games, I think. But yeah, Cavendish was here and Bennett was here, but it was like they may as well not have been here. The motivation didn't seem high. Are you disappointed by Kane and Groves in this race? Kind of, to be honest, because he must be in good shape. Because I went I went looking when Appleson announced they signed him, I went looking for his his numbers, and I know he did really well in Catalonia. And on stage three, for example, he did for six minutes in a 25-minute period, there were three climbs, and he did at 76, 77 kilos sort of range, he did like 5.8, then 6.1, then 6, I think, for six minutes with very short rest between them. And he made group one. Obviously, he couldn't contest the finish because it was uphill, but he got over that. That's like Philipson level or better. Like this guy can really climb, but the sprints were the problem. And for, for me, Benji, what seems to have happened with him is like I'm just waiting him, for him to put it together where he does the really good climbing performance and makes a finish he shouldn't and has the sprint to win. It seems yeah. like he's not put those two together in a big race yet, but I know he has both components. Like he's beaten in Tour of Turkey, you know, in easy stages, he's beaten Philipson and Cav. And he's gotten over hard climbs in Catalonia, but it just hasn't put it together. I'm waiting for him to do it, um, yep. but I think that'll be at Alperson next year. Exactly. We can talk about a bit that a bit more in our transfer roundup. Let's focus on uh, this race for now. And that's another name that I want to bring up, Sam Bennett. He's uh, not having the best of days, is he? Well, this is like the Vuelta um, audition, isn't it? Like he didn't do the Tour de France. He didn't do the Giro. And he's not had a great year in a first of a two-year deal at Bora Hansgrohe. And he looked to be the star of the year was terrible. But apparently that there was a plan. And then he won Ashbourne Frankfurt in, in the start of May. And I thought, okay. And then Limburg's Hill, he came fifth. Balwaza fourth. Okay, still not brilliant. And then he's had a big layoff before this race. And yeah, he just he just doesn't have it. So I don't know. I don't know. Like, what option do Bora have? They've probably paying him a lot of money to not take him to the if they don't take him to any race, but does he even isn't a geese going to the, like? I don't think they can, Benji. They got Hindley. I don't know if Wilco's doing it. Uh, Igita's doing it. They have serious guys in good form. They can't be giving out slots to riders to race Agreed. on the hope they'll be good. Agreed. I don't think Sam Bennett should be riding the Vuelta based on what we've seen this year. He hasn't performed up to that level. He's had one race that he was winning, which was Ashburn Frankfurt, and. That was not necessarily the the most outrageously godlike sprint either. So I'm not rating him at a at a level where I consider him over taking a spot away from other riders from the team, knowing that they've got riders that can actually compete for the overall in this Vuelta, like Hindley, for example. So Higita's looking pretty fire as well at the moment. So 
he needs to be in that squad. Yeah, he had his crash during this race, but I don't think he's actually heavily injured from what I can tell. So, like, I don't think Bennett should be in the Velta, as simple as that. And then the question is, how long is he at, at Bora for? Well, another year. So will they be able to get it right next year with Sam Bennett? That is where I think it's up to right now. I don't think this year is the is the period we should be talking about when it comes to Sam Bennett anymore. I think it's, can they get him on the rails for 2023 instead? The only chance I would have, he might go is because Jordy Mayus just crashed and broke his collarbone. Mayus yeah. looked in really, really good shape. He's He's been improving. I think you could have taken as one of the eight. I don't think Bora is so deep that they couldn't have taken Jordy Mayus as one of the eight riders. The Vuelta and said, zero lead out, do it yourself whatever do it but he's crashed out so maybe maybe bennett gets in that way like that uh provisional list says frederick vandal 21 year old but he's looked all right uh, yeah i don't know it's it's difficult they've signed they, i mean they also signed archbold and mullen to kind of pair with him so it's not worked out too well uh so far but yeah demar keeps winning he's had a much better year this year compared to last year um but probably I don't know, just a race. <laughs> just an interesting race, Polonia. A lot of sprints. Um, what about Hater? We haven't really spoken about him. He wins GC, his first World Tour GC win. Missed out on the Commonwealth Games 4. I had to explain to Benji what that was the other day, the Commonwealth Games. Um, <laughs> what does this even mean for Ethan Hater? To be honest, it doesn't change anything either. Like He he did fine in the TT, and FDJ hate Bruno Army Rail, and that's what it was. <laughs> they do. I think we'll- I think last year when Polonia happened, I tweeted something about uh, Ethan Hater would have won through the Polonia if he was here. So the fact that I already fought that last year and it just proves it this year doesn't mean that he evolved between last year and this year, for example. So I feel like Ethan Hater has had a relatively decent year, but I expected more from him when I saw him last year. I expected this year to be the year where he steps up to proper role to race and not Tour de Pologne because for me Tour de Pologne is not the level of a Paranese or a Tirreno Adriatico those kind of races Tour de Pologne is the the first step into World Tour a race that on paper is basically on the level of a high level pro tier race I'd say at the moment so I don't think there's any changes for me in terms of even hate or just confirming what I thought last year even though I don't know, yeah, I, I still I still believe it. Hater would have long, won last year, and Almeida would have lost if Ethan Hater was there last year. I mean, yeah, he. I don't know what I don't know if he's his extension at Ineos. I'm not sure if there has been one announced. His brother got signed, so I assume, like we haven't heard anything, but I assume he's going to stay at Ineos. I think Ethan Hater's Neo Pro contract. Has to be one of the best ever, unless there was renegotiations. He's won 16 races uh, whilst at Ineos in two in about two years, two uh, three seasons. He's won the British National Champs ITT twice. He has he's won now a World Tour GC. He's won two World Tour races aside from that at Romandy this year. I know it's Romandy, but a lot of it still isn't that breakthrough that you're mentioning benji it's a romandy prologue it's a tour de Pologne gc yeah and that's it's really good and he's you know 16 races on a neopro contract let's not forget that it's really good but the next contract ain't going to be cheap and the expectation one would assume is are you going to be able to top three milano san remo can we pencil you yeah. in as a guy who's going to make the gen vevelhem on loop finishes in March and February and Milano San Remo, are you going to be able to win Bing Bang Tour, which rest in peace this year? Or, like, you know, are you a favorite for or a top three for a Tour de Suisse like San Thomas Sebastian? Was? Is that nah, too difficult? I it's too hard. I reckon it's too hard. Okay. Um, and and, I, and we haven't it? seen that. He's kind of just kept winning the same races or yeah. doing the same sort of thing. We haven't seen that 20 minute, holy shit, this guy. He can really climb as well now. So, like, do you, I don't know. Do you, do you think he'll be in the finish from Lana San Remo next year? 
he has to step up next year. That's for sure. Like from this point onward, like he kind of stagnated over the last year. His time trial is like top tier level though yeah, at the moment, which TG. is fantastic to see. But he still lost from Ardensman, which I didn't expect the day before. But like going into the rest of the season, I don't think this season is at the Vuelta. Like the Vuelta could actually be the spot where he steps up. If he's indeed in the team for the Vuelta, which I expect him to be, I think that is a situation where he can get a stage. I mean, the Vuelta, again, that is where you want to show on these, there's like 12 kilometers, 6.5% climbs. Can Hater do what Wout van Aert does? Where if the GC guys kind of soft pace that at 5.5 watts per kilo, 5.7, can he sprint for the win? And against sort of GC guys on a climb like that. I think with his solo zone performance, I don't know, maybe. I, I think he physically can. And he's like light enough. But they're going to be paying a lot of money, I think, next year, Benji, to a guy who's not comfortable riding in the bunch. Like, let's be honest. Yeah. Like, that's the big risk. And if it's classics, they got Peacock, Sheffield, Clock. They all deserve leadership. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, I think he didn't contest any sprint finishes here, but it's, yeah, it's weird to kind of be negative about a guy that just won the first World Tour GC, but it is interesting to see. Like, um, he kind of backdoored it, but he's still still obviously a really good rider on the yep. overhead contracts. So we'll see with Hater. Um, maybe it boosts his confidence. But that's a lot on Tour de Polonia. We'll be back tomorrow with the World Tour Burgos wrap up where the Neo, not even Neo pros, Stagiaire is going crazy. Yeah. Uh, which is really, really good to see. <laughs> Some transfer news, as well as uh, Wapenart's decision to not do the Wollongong TT, uh, which we'll have Don't. some thoughts on that. Don't forget the amazing sacrifice of guys to give that we'll be uh, discussing in tomorrow oh, in, yeah. in that transfer roundup as well. Hopefully Israel realized they don't get turns points. But that's for tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening as always. Ciao.